This plane here that I am touching was the lead plane on Dina. The true design of this aircraft actually transitioned across from civilian. <laughs> yes, I know. Yes, I did that on purpose. All right, so this is Mindy. I want to thank you for allowing us to film today. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to go for a ride later on, but Mindy's going to take us around the aircraft and tell us a lot more about it, and we'll take a dive in depth and see what's what. So. Tell us about yourself real quick first and how did you end up in this plane? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Mindy Russell. I've been with uh, the Commemorative Air Force Central Texas Wing for about two years. Uh, how I got entered in it, I bought a P-51 Mustang ride at the, the hangar where they're housed yeah. one day and met a few of the people and I kind of felt like the claws kind of gather in at that point in time and a couple months later I've walked through the door and I've never looked back, never left and uh, now I'm a crew chief of the C-47, wow. so. Wow, so uh, leading into, this is a C-47, right? Um, tell us about this one specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, C-47 behind us uh, is called That's All Brother. This uh, airplane is probably the most historically significant aircraft that's still flying today. This airplane right here led over 800 other C-47s that contained over 13,000 paratroopers into Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. What? What? So this this plane this plane led, led the, the main invasions. airborne invasion. Yes. Wow. There's a, I didn't know that until today. Uh, okay. So yeah, leading into you know a lot of people know uh, the gist of D-Day. Um, why uh, why was the C-47 the plane for the tool of choice for that operation? Uh, the C-47 is a very versatile plane. Uh, you can haul paratroopers, move cargo. Uh, put stretchers in there, move injured soldiers out from the battlefield. Uh, it's a great stable platform um, from my understanding. And this one was chosen, chosen specifically because it had the advanced radar um, that was needed to lead the invasion. It had three different types of radar systems on it that uh, only a handful of the C-47s had. So there was a reason that this particular plane led the invasion? Yes, sir. Um, one of them, you see these little antenna right behind us up here? Mm -hmm. That's part of the Rebecca uh, Eureka range finding system. And so when D-Day was beginning, a small group of pathfinders went in and they put Eureka beacons on the landing zone to mark oh. the landing zones. Um, and the Rebecca receiver up here is what helped triangulate them on that position. Uh, also, it's not on the airplane now where we don't fly with it, but it would have had a large dome underneath that contained the SCR-717 radar. And basically it was a, uh, it could distinguish between land and water and kind of geographical features. Okay. It wouldn't show you like a city or buildings, but it would allow you to, you know, differentiate cliffs, rivers, that type of stuff. Hmm. And then the last system it had was the, the G system. And basically that would, uh, triangulate uh, radio positions, uh, the British had placed transmitters along the French coastline and the G system would pick up on that and they could triangulate their positions. Wow. And this plane had all three. Huh. So of that fleet of how many? 800 and... Uh, I believe it was 821. Okay. Exactly. Um, how many of them had that, that particular radar set up? Not too many? Nope, not too many. From my understanding, it was only a handful. Okay. Like okay. a literal handful that possibly had that equipment on there. So this this plane here that I am touching was the lead plane on D-Day. I, st I still can't fathom that. And going for a ride in this is going to be a huge honor. But while we're under the engine, uh, we've got a lot of engine nerds on the channel. Um, <laughs> they got the gear heads. Tell us, tell us about this engine in particular. Uh, this is a Pratt Whitney 1830, uh, 14 cylinders, air-cooled engine. Uh, I don't know the exact horsepower, but we have two of them. It takes about 56 spark plugs for each engine. Ooh. Uh, so you can imagine what the maintenance is like on here. Yeah, okay. And um, the Pratt & Whitney was um, predominantly the main engine in this plane, or did they sub out a few other? Um, that was the main engine, I believe, in the military version, mm -hmm. when the, the C-47 is based on the DC-3, which was designed in the mid-30s for the airlines. And I believe they had right 1820s on there. So that brings up a good point. 
the true design of this aircraft actually transitioned across from civilian. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a design with a slide rule and a pencil uh, in the mid 30s for airline travel um, was competing against the Boeing 247, mm -hmm. um, which was one of the new hotshot ones that was coming out. And uh, one of the airlines wrote the Douglas Corporation said, hey, design me a plane that is more efficient, can hold more people, and is more economical. Came out with the DC-1, the Douglas Commercial One. Mm -hmm. uh, upgraded that, DC-2, up to the DC-3, and this is like the gold standard. Wow. Um, this one has withstood the test of time. There's about 500 of them that came off the production line for the airlines, I believe, yep. and then it transitioned into military uh, okay. production at that point. Now, you mentioned the Douglas Company. Is that the same company that went on to become McDonnell Douglas? I believe so. It is? Okay. Eventually, yes. I think they just keep eating each other up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. And then for those that don't really know, um, can you go through some of the differences in DC-3 and C-47? Uh, the DC-3 has much more comfortable seats. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were loud and actually they designed a sleeper version, which they have later found out wasn't very economical, but the, well, the stewardess would actually come through, wake you up, could take a nap, go in oh, Los wow. Angeles to New York. Huh. Uh, and then they decided they could put more seats in there and make it more economical. And it's really what made airline travel possible for all of us today. Because mm -hmm. if you remember in the golden age of aviation, when it was a luxury. You'd spend a month's worth of salary right to fly it was noisy it was stinky and everything and this is what this is one of the three inventions that changed the world according to dwight eisenhower yes the c-47 the jeep willies mm -hmm. and the two and a half ton truck huh. um and then modifications to like the airframe or the wing or the engines between c-47 and dc-3 um i believe they, they strengthened it a little bit and then they added another door in the back if you look at the airline versions the passenger door like kind of drops down mm -hmm. ours swings out and then we have another rear cargo door that swings out this way okay. so you could literally drop the pan seats inside put some ramps up there put two jeeps in there a small field gun howitzer wow so moving back into specifically uh, this plane, do we know like serial number, year of build, uh, factory, that type of thing? Uh, it was March 1944. Okay. I want to say it was March 6th or March 8th. I would need to double check that. Uh, airplane. And then it would transition to England in April 1944, D-Day invasion June 6, 44. And I believe it was in pretty much every uh, major airborne operation from D-Day until the end of the war. The, you know, uh, relief of uh, Bastogne, mm -hmm. um, Market Garden, uh, crossing the Rhine, yeah, that type of stuff. And how many C-47s did they build? I want to say the U.S. built over 11,000, mm -hmm. uh, but the Japanese also had blueprints. Really? To build a C-40 or similar model. And I believe the Russians had some variations that were built as well. And that was wartime military? I know it was either wartime or after wartime. Okay, yeah. Um, and then the factories, were they only building the these in the one factory or were they um, so I believe there was Long Beach, Oklahoma, and I believe there might have been another one. I just don't remember off okay, the top of my cool. head. Cool. So we got a lot of nose art guys on the channel. Um, best time to talk about the name and the nose art. What can you tell us? Absolutely. Uh, John Donaldson, uh, the pilot who's also the troop carrier squadron commander uh, on D-Day for that mission. I was his personal message to Hitler. That's all, brother. We're here. It's done. Time's over. Huh. Okay. And um, do we know, like, that's an incredible recreation of the nose art for the restoration. Um, was that one of the guys on your crew that recreated that one there? Um, that... I don't know. I know we had a lot of, during the restoration, um, I believe they probably got a graphic artist that mm -hmm. kind of specialized in that stuff. Um, I know there's actually other videos out there that show them painting wow. and how they projected it on there because uh, they, they took all the old black and white, you know, archive yep. photos. Um, there's actually really cool archival film footage of Eisenhower standing right outside that door really? talking to the paratroopers on June 5th. We'll have we'll have that like playing as, <laughs> as she just said. <laughs> um, wow, that's crazy. All right, so yeah, let's begin our uh, in-depth look, so to speak. So we got uh, these stenciled numbers all along, like these 50s numbers here. What, did what is that? 
Um, that's access panels. Okay. So you can get up there. Um, you got uh, like hydraulic lines, uh, instruments, uh, fuel lines. You could actually open them up for maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually all over the plane. If you look, there's engine controls, battery cart if it you know needs to start from the outside, tank selector, valve covers, de-icer units. Um, pretty much anything and everything you would need to be have access to, you could get through there. And then when we do our inspections um, and you know break it down for winter maintenance and everything, all those are opened and just. So that number, does that correlate with the specific check on like a checklist? Probably somewhere it does. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, if if we can go through and talk about pre-flight, like very briefly. Um, what are we looking for during that? Uh, when I'm doing a pre-flight, um, I usually start right there by the back of the doors and I crawl under and I'm gonna check the tail wheel. I'm gonna mm -hmm. make sure all the cotter pins are in there, the struts at the right height. Um, just look for anything out of the ordinary and then you know I'll go underneath the elevators. I'm checking all the cotter pins. I check movement, same with the rudder. Continue walking around and I'm really looking at everything mm -hmm. from the top of the rudder, down, walk up, I walk along the wings, I'm checking all the connections for the ailerons there, I'm checking lights, you know, anything that would be safety wired, um, like the, the headlamps or the landing lights, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, you know, make sure the safety wire is good on there. Um, please, making sure there's no abnormal leaks or anything, I'll stick a flashlight and I'll, I'll check inside the gear housing, you know, look inside the engine, just make sure everything looks normal. Yeah. Make sure there's uh, nothing jumping out. Uh, it's an old radial engine, so if it's not leaking, Hmm. Might be out of oil at that <laughs> point right. in time. Um, but no, we're just kind of overlooking everything on there. Put some, you know, check the fuel levels, make sure I have the, the fuel on there that the pilots want for the day. Now is that sure dipstick or a sight gloss? Uh, it's a dipstick. Okay, yep. yep. Yeah, we, uh, we have four tanks, two main, two mm -hmm. auxiliary. Uh, I can carry a total of 804 gallons of fuel. Okay. Each engine can hold up to 29 gallons of oil. Uh, we never really go above 24 or 25. Um, it just starts to kind of flow out the overflow valves and just... And do you have the consumption of oil like per hour? Um, we go through about a gallon of oil per hour. So about uh, half a gallon on each engine. And we mm -hmm. go through about uh, roughly 100 gallons of fuel every hour we fly. Okay. So yeah, good opportunity to talk about um, like our ceiling level, like the max ceiling these guys would be flying at? Well, in World War II, the max ceiling level is 24,000 feet. They mm -hmm. used to fly these over the hump into yeah. China. Um, nowadays, we're not on oxygen, so we really want to stay, you know, pretty much under that 11,000, right. you know, range on there. Okay, and then today when we go for our flight, what are we going to sit at? Um, we were probably about uh, 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet okay. somewhere yeah. up uh, there. We got this... Uh, section here, we've got a lot of guys that are familiar with radials, um, you know, 17s and 24s, but I'm yet to see a radial personally with the oil cooler. With the oil right, coolers? Right there, yeah. Yeah, basically uh, the hot engine oil can cycle down in there, cools off, goes okay. back up. Um, and then talk about the uh, cow, cow yeah, flaps. Yeah, those are cow flaps. Mm -hmm. um, we can open and close those to help uh, cool the cylinder, the cylinders inside the engine. Um, you know, if they're running a little warm, open them all the way up. Mm -hmm. If they're running just fine, we can close them. Uh, we can run them, you know, just what we really need them, and they're they're used for engine cooling purposes. So, uh, a lot of those Normandy sort of campaign uh, planes and vehicles, you see these stripes. Uh, take a minute to talk about why they did that and why are they so hastily painted on? Yeah. Um, the black and white stripes, uh, they're referred to as invasion stripes, and pretty much any time you see these, you're going to think of June 6, 1944, D-Day. Um, basically, I believe there was an operation in Sicily uh, some time before, and we actually shot down a lot of our own planes. Um, so, uh, you know, operation of this magnitude, we had to go through and figure out a way for them to identify the planes. So big black and white stripes was it is. And they were very hastily painted on. They only gave the crews three days to paint all of the stripes on the planes. Mm. So they put them on with paintbrushes, t-shirts, mop heads, whatever they could find to put them on there. I actually heard a story that they actually ran out of black and white paint and broke into the English hardware stores and left IOUs. <laughs> And then touching on the uh, the restoration, uh, it all lies in the details and the quality and, and the restoration crews have even done the, the hastily painted uh, stripe. So that's a really good uh, detail. Very cool. And is that the aircraft's? That's the tail number. Is that the same as the serial number on the data plate? 
I believe so. And actually what's missing off of it that they never put on there would be a four at the front. And it would be for year 42, the year the plane was ordered. Oh, okay, interesting. So yeah, when you if you look at archival film footage or pictures, you'll see that exact tail number. Huh. What are the, the wires that run up to the tail? Uh, they were a uh, type of antenna. For the radio? Yeah. Okay. So we were looking at a lot of other aircraft and you see a lot of the metallic, uh, the aluminum sheet metal. Why are your control surfaces more in canvas? Um, all of our large flight surfaces are in canvas. Uh, our elevators, our rudders, and our ailerons. Uh, for one, it's a light material. All it has to do is steer the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm told that's kind of the main reason for weight alone. But you'll hear some people say that uh, wartime uh, materials were short. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hence that is easily repairable. But I'm told the main reason is weight. Okay. And then do you know why we have the the large surface area here and then the additional smaller ones? Oh, uh, those are trim no. tabs. Okay. Helps with just little minute adjustments and but they fly. So is that a, a separate control or it's all on that? Yeah, there's, there's a there's a trim wheel that will work some of it and I believe some trim tabs at the bottom of the okay. base in the co uh, cockpit. Hmm. Kurt? Yes, sir. Kurt Lewis. Yeah. And your pilot? Yep. Okay. Um, so we're going to go fly this thing later on, but um, tell us about, um, before we get into this plane specifically, your story real quick about getting into planes in general. Yeah, um, I'm a typical airport brat. You know, my dad's been flying small airplanes and especially gliders his whole life. So huh. I grew up hanging out at the glider port with him every weekend. And uh, it's all I've ever wanted to do. And it's all I really know how to do is, is, is fly airplanes. And I uh, was, was very blessed to be, get started at a real young age, you know, getting my mm -hmm. glider ratings and right into airplane ratings and, uh, you know, checking all the boxes to end up where I am now, flying for a major airline to pay the bills to come fly good airplanes like this. Wow. So, so you're doing what you love. That's absolutely, important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so prior to C-47, what uh, have you flown other warbirds wise? Yeah, I've been in the, got, again, got very lucky to get involved with the Commemorative Air Force when I was about 21. I think I'm currently qualified in eight or nine of our airplanes wow. and uh, spend most of my time flying our B-29 Fifi and Diamond Lil around the country on the Air Power History Tour. Wow. And uh, we just parked those for, well, we, our tour just got home last weekend, so then I uh, fill in on, Jumping get to fill in on, on this airplane yeah. every once in a while once. Uh, so once talk about, that, that's a lot of experience, a lot of uh, different qualifications. Uh, how would you describe the C-47 specifically comparing to all those other aircraft? Yeah, well, it's um, it's a very, uh, anybody who's flown a Piper J3 Cub, and you know, I've always heard my whole life that a DC-3 is just a big twin engine Cub, and it's, it's really true. Mm -hmm. The first time I flew it, the control response, if you've flown a J3 Cub or really any old, pretty much any old light tube and fabric tail dragger, if you hit a gust of wind that lifts the wing up, the amount of control input and the delay it takes to put that wing back down matches this very, very accurately. But um, wow. other than that, it's a real honest, it's a very stable airplane. You know, as far as a tailwheel airplane, the uh, the geometry of it makes it a pretty, pretty as far as warbirds go, pretty easy airplane to fly. You know, it's got big wide wheels, huge rudder in the back for directional control. Okay. And uh, it's a very honest, stable airplane. Things just don't happen very fast. You know, it's not, not the most maneuverable airplane. It's kind of sluggish in all responses, but that's mm -hmm. true of of most transport airplanes back back in the 1940s. And the, the, the one thing about the C-47 is that huge wing surface. Mm -hmm. um, what does that do for you? Uh, you? Do you notice that as you're flying it? Yeah, it's especially critical on takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, when it's in the three-point attitude like it is on the ground, that's a lot of drag. So the you'll notice pretty much the first thing you do on takeoff is as soon as we can, get that tail up in the air. Okay. So we're pushing, you know, there's a lot less um, parasitic drag caused by the wing moving through the air at the three-point attitude, and then that gets the rudder up in the air so that the rudder can have some airflow over it and some effectiveness as well. Okay. Um, but the big wing allows it to carry a lot of cargo. You know, it's, uh, it's great at hauling a lot of people and a lot of uh, cargo around, and then that also lets it fly very slowly so we can fly it in and out of pretty short strips. And okay. uh, we're, pretty, we're pretty conservative with it now, but you know, yeah. wartime, they were, they were doing some pretty amazing things with off airport operations with, uh, with these things. And uh, when you go into a bank on one of these, do you feel it drag in the other direction a yeah. bit? Yeah, because the, like you said, the wingspan is so big. And if you look at how huge the ailerons are, you know, the ailerons is about as big as a J3 Cub wing out there. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of adverse yaw. So we kind of lead, almost lead the turns with the rudder mm -hmm. to make that turn happen smoothly and uh, coordinated how we want it to. Okay. And then in terms of reliability, if we had an engine failure, can we 
Can we still do pretty well on one engine in this? Yeah, thing? yeah. yeah. Um, we were we were just looking at that a lot today because this morning we just flew it over from Denver mm -hmm. uh, here and we had to cross some pretty high terrain. So anytime we're flying a twin engine airplane or a multi engine airplane through the mountains, uh, we're worried about how you know our single engine service ceiling they call it. And this thing, uh, our our chart number said it should be able to hold altitude up to like nine or ten thousand feet on one engine. Mm -hmm. Uh, up to the mountains like this. So we're, we're always having like an out. We always know where our closest airport is and where all the lower terrain is and everything. Okay, cool. But uh, yeah, anytime you're flying a multi-engine airplane, you're, you're concerned about not necessarily how well it do on two engines, but how, what's it gonna do when you're flying it on one engine. Of course, yeah. And uh, pretty much to wrap it up, there, there are a lot of C-47s and even more DC-3s out there flying, but you are flying the lead plane even onto D-Day. Yeah. Uh, how does that feel like? Well, if I think about it too much, I'd probably be too afraid to fly it. But you know, we, we get That's plenty of time point. on, <laughs> yeah, plenty of time on the ground to think about and appreciate that. You know what this airplane did for our country and and what it means. And certainly, out of all the airplanes and warbirds I've flown, this has the highest uh, pedigree. Yeah, I like to call it as far yeah. as um, yeah. what it actually did. Uh, you know, but participating in basically every airborne invasion that that the U.S. was involved in uh, mm -hmm. in World War II. Um, right. it, it, I find it interesting since I grew up flying gliders that this airplane delivered a lot of gliders and in, in it, it, it delivered paratroopers in, into Normandy, but Market Garden it did two or three trips in towing uh, British gliders. Wow! So it's got it's got the glider tow hook installed and some of the glider tow equipment in the back, which uh, I've flown seven or eight different DC3s, but this is the only one that has that, which I think is Absolutely. really cool. Which... Well, thank you very much. Yeah. That was excellent. No, thanks for coming flying yeah. with us. Hope you have thank a good you. time. Cool, will do. So yeah, the everyone knows the D-Day gliders. And I see glider release there. Uh, yeah, they would have had a hookup. They could, uh, you know, hook up to some gliders, pull them off the ground. Um, they could drop supplies in that way. Uh, also, they could haul out injured troops. Oh. That way, they would put the troops in a glider. And um, I've seen video where they put the the rope between two poles, and the plane would come in uh, low, catch onto wow. the glider, and take off with it. Huh. Really? Huh. Interesting. This is uh, the cockpit. Um, pilot on the left, right? Yep, pilot okay. on the left, co-pilot on the right. Okay, um, and then yeah, they've, they've done an amazing restoration, like, th this is pretty, very nice. Uh, and then we have, other than those modern accoutrements, is this pretty much uh, stock World War II setup? Yeah, actually when they uh, did uh, the restoration up at Basler Turbo Conversion in Oshkosh, mm -hmm. um, if they needed a gauge, they'd go to their warehouse and they'd pull out a brand new gauge from 1942. Wow. It's like, hey, send us to the shop, see if it works, huh. put it in the plane. So right back here, this is the hamburger door. You can see it from the outside. It's like right underneath the three X area. Uh, we call it the hamburger door because if you go outside this door, you want to make sure this propeller has stopped turning. You have 12 inches or less clearance between that turning prop and you. Now, if the crew was sitting somewhere or if it was like an airline crew and the airlines were using it, they would actually pass up, uh, while they were waiting to be loaded, they would pass up lunches up through that door. Huh. They put them on a stick and stick them up here for the crew. So that's where the name comes from? Nope, actually the name for the hamburger door comes from how close the prop is to it. And if you go out that door, you're going to be hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Okay. Um, so we mentioned crew before. Uh, crew of this plane during the war was how many? Uh, on the D-Day, um, uh, on the mission into Normandy on D-Day, uh, there was a crew of, I believe, six. Uh, they had uh, an extra navigator with them and an extra pilot. Um, a little bit of redundancy in there. So that was purely in the event of someone getting wounded, they had... Uh, possibly, or it's always better to have two sets of eyes, yeah. you know, on the maps and stuff. Um, but that was a hand-chosen crew by Don Donaldson, the Troop Carrier Squadron Commander. And they had one extra special passenger on that mission into Normandy. The pilot, John Donaldson, actually took his dog with him, a little Scottish Terrier, and this plane, Carrie, this is our representation of that mission and that dog. Um, we fly everywhere with this thing. Uh, he's been all over, and if you actually, when you go back to our tent area and you look at our posters, you'll see John, John Donaldson holding the dog, just hmm. like this in the crew photo. What's the dog's name? That I do not know. Okay. <laughs> uh, this little guy, we call him Tab. Okay. That's so, fair. Yeah. but yeah, you can see it has its own dog tag and everything. Huh. So I guess that sheds a lot of light on uh, the responsibility that was on this plane in particular, hence the extra crew. Uh, if your lead plane for that formation of that size is taken out, uh, you're in trouble. Yep. 
and this plane actually took off two and a half hours before all the other planes um, just because it had to actually circle and wait for everyone else to join up on them before they went over the channel. Jeez. So I would imagine in that time it was uh, getting shot at? So. Um, no, not when they were up there circling. They wouldn't have been until they went over the channel and got into Oh, France. you mean they were yeah. circling above uh, England, England yeah. uh, to get that rally point all squared Yep, away. get everyone else uh, on them. Okay. Is that the engine starter tag? Uh, this is the plane. So uh, I'm sorry, accepted, the plane. Yeah, that's the plane. Yeah, accepted March 6th, 1944. You want to get a better view on that? Briefly take this chance to go through some of the components that we see on the way back. Okay. As we walk backwards through uh, the cockpit or the forward cabin area, uh, right over here you're going to see the navigator station. Uh, there's a table that could fold up. They could put their maps out. And then you have part of the... Uh, the G radar system and then the SCR uh, 717 um, receiver right there. Um, you also have your drift meter over here. Um, nice, comfortable, you know, wooden stool for the navigator there. Uh, as you look over on this side, it's kind of cramped, but this is where your radio operator would sit. As you can see, it's kind of a tight area right there. Uh, kind of a cool thing. If you look back there, I believe there's a telegraph, so they could do Morse code. Oh, yeah. huh. um, tons of equipment. I have no idea how they used it. Yeah. Well, and that was all the experimental at the time, a lot of that stuff. Yeah, and then if you look right above me, you got uh, the Astrodome. Uh, there's a sextant up there. They could also, you know, get their position by the stars. Hmm. So we're in the business end now, the uh, the delivery package. Uh, so this is the, the, the paratrooper configuration as we see it. Yes. And on that first mission in Normandy, I believe we, I'm told we were, took 13 uh, paratroopers of the 101st. Uh, we took a smaller load than the other planes because we had all the extra radar equipment on here. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, why no, no cushions or is this, this is all by design? Uh, uh, it was pretty much the way it was designed. You figure those guys had 80 to 120 pounds of gear on them and they had a little bit of you know, cushion with their parachute and everything else. And it wasn't made for, for creature comfort. Yep. It was made for them to be able to get them from point A to point B, you know, stand up, hook up, shuffle to the door, out they go. Okay. Um, and then this is obviously like a, a utility aircraft. I see that a lot of these can fold up for changing your loadout. Yeah, absolutely. We can drop these pan seats down. Um, we can open this back door back here and put some ramps up. We can put two Jeeps and a small howitzer up here. Uh, we could put 14 stretchers in here with three nurses to care for them. Or we could put 6,000 pounds of general cargo in here, whatever would be needed. So that's your load out, 6,000 is the max. Yeah. Okay. And are you aware of any stories where they kind of went above that? I'm, I'm sure, and I don't know any specific stories, but I'm sure during wartime, um, I'm sure they broke that threshold yeah. quite quite often. Uh, so a good time to bring up a lot of the old aircraft, uh, when you get in them, you know, Caribous, B-17s, things like that, you can see the control lines running across the roof, but I don't see that here. Is that, is it a different system? Uh, it's, the control lines are actually running beneath us on the floor. Okay. Uh, that's where your, your cables for your elevators, rudder, ailerons are all underneath there. It's actually very neat. Uh, it's very stark and bare except for those cables and one tiny little bundle of wires like this that, hmm. you know, for the modern avionics that we have. I would imagine perhaps that some of that is by design so some dude in the dock doesn't hook up to the control line. Probably. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but that's actually a good way to think about it. So that one line that we do have, we're moving into the specifics of jumping now. So can you talk about the, the, uh, the steps in uh, from hooking up to jumping? Um, basically, I guess they would, you know, the jump master would, you know, give them the time out, stand up, hook up. Everyone's going to check the person in front of them, make sure everyone's good. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they're over the, the drop zone back here, you got a red light, green light. Mm -hmm. um, the you know air crew will give them a green light, and that jump master, you know, if he's satisfied, he's going to give that command to go, and they would just step out the door. And as they stepped out the door, as they started to clear the tail, um, the cord would pull their sheet. Okay. We have the the jump master station. What what are we looking at here? So these um, the C forty seven could also haul cargo packs underneath the belly that were strapped to it, um, and this would be the release. Pack oh. one, pack two, pack three. 
Okay. Huh. And the jump master, he was another member of the crew? Um, no, I, I, he was probably with the, the paratroopers. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, uh, what's the situation back here, this so, little area? Back here, remember it was first designed as a uh, plane for the airlines. Mm -hmm. So back there is toilet, oh. toilet and urinal. Um, and actually, there is one behind the door. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just hidden, but we primarily use it for storage. We'll put our control locks back there, some extra supplies that we need. Um, you could use the toilet as a cooler. Yeah. Nice beer in there. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. And then <laughs> you can see another door back there, and that's the way we would get to the tail cone. Um, that's where the cables for the, the you know rudder and stuff is to make sure everything's good back there. Okay. And lastly, uh, before we get out, we see the, the door set up for the paratroopers. Um, did they take that off or was that closed and they would open in flight? Actually, um, we would close this main door here mm -hmm. and I could probably show you this better from outside, but there's an inner door. So mm -hmm. you close the main door, it's gotta be latched. And then you, uh, before you take off, you don't do it in flight, you pull the inner door out. Ah. Uh. So yeah, right. trying to open up a door into the oncoming wind, it's not yeah. gonna happen. So, yeah. I mean, before they took off, the inner door was already out and it was, you know, ready for, you know, jump. Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, nothing else in the plane worth discussing at the minute? No, not really. Uh, the only thing I, the questions I always get asked, number one, what are the curtains for? Those are the blackout curtains because the guys would be in here smoking cigarettes or, you know, looking at their maps and stuff. So they could put those curtains up um, uh, for blackout purposes. And everyone asks if, if these are the air conditioning. These are not the air conditioning. These are actually gun ports. I don't know if they were ever used. This is a completely unarmed aircraft, but if useless from the air, but I guess if the enemy was storming your plane on the ground, if you had some armed troops in there, they could pop those open, pop their guns out. Okay. And kind cool. of defend it. So a couple little tidbits for you. That's interesting.
Well, that's basically a wrap of uh, C47 in depth, and it's been a pleasure flying with you guys. And thank you for talking with us today. Absolutely, thank you. Anytime. Appreciate it. Out.